Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. It's Dachian Miller, and we're here with this week's episode of Kuden, episode 146. And uh, I'm alone today. James had some other obligations, so I'm going to be playing my own production manager as well. So we'll see how that goes. Right. So anyway, um, let's see. Uh, well, I'm going to have to navigate a whole bunch of other things that he normally takes care of. But let's do this. Um, today's episode, right, is actually part one of a two part series. Uh, I just felt the need to, to break these things up. But normally in uh, Japanese martial arts and Zen, uh, Zen Buddhism and uh, just generally that way. Right. These two topics I'm going to be covering between this episode and next episode uh, typically go together. OK, so Tsuki no Kokoro and Mizu no Kokoro. So Tsuki no Kokoro, um, mind like the moon, moon in the mind, that kind of thing. Right. And then Mizu no Kokoro. Um, mind like water, water in the mind, that kind of thing, right? Not like water on the brain. Uh, but anyway, so uh, this episode, right, we're going to take a look at this idea, right? This concept that shows up a lot in Japanese martial arts. I'm also going to take a look at, we're going to go much more deeply than, than it's normally covered, right? And of course, right? And then uh, we also want to make these correlations to uh, Mikyo, where the reference is a little bit different, but the idea is the same. OK, so uh, we'll be back here in just a minute. Let's go ahead and officially or formally start uh, this episode of Kuden Radio. So the big question is this, how are self-defense and success minded people like us, concerned citizens worried about protecting ourselves, our loved ones and the things we care about from the monsters we know exist in the world? How do we train in a way that gives us the skills, knowledge and understanding we need without becoming paranoid fighters or killers ourselves? and yet still allows us to be the hero protector the world needs us to be? That's the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. My name is Jeffrey Miller, and welcome to Kuden Radio, real training for real people in a real world. And that's my story. Anyway, all right. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, I need to fire up the chat side of things, but I have to be careful with what I hit because we don't want it showing up on the screen. Uh, James taught me a little trick with that. Um, hold on a second, I need to get rid of a pop-up window here. Anyway, all right, so I um, want to make sure that I'm checking in with folks and I can see it along the side here, but we don't need anybody hijacking our stream like has happened in the past, and then um, it makes me want to have a different kind of conversation with somebody. Anyway, it looks like Lee is on. There's um, eight or so. Uh, you guys might be able to see those things on the other end, but either way, uh, we are going to jump right in. So uh, let's start with a quote, right? Uh, I'm going to make tonight's stuff as applicable to self-protection as possible, but we have to remember that this is not strictly a karate, martial arts, ninjutsu kind of concept, okay? This idea of tsuki no kokoro, mind like the moon, moon in the mind, that kind of thing, right, um, <clears throat> is actually uh, a Zen thing, right? So which means it's life mastery skills that just happen to have an application uh, on the martial side. Okay. So a uh, quick quote here from Japan's most famous swordsman, Miyamoto Musashi, right? Um, and the quote is, if, you, if you've read the Book of Five Rings, then you're probably familiar with it. Or if you're just an avid um, follower of, uh, mm, I don't know, online memes, right? Just collect a whole bunch of quotes or pass them around to your friends. But we're not going to take any time to actually th sit and think about it beyond the, oh, that makes sense. Oh, that's very wise. Oh, that's very um, bullshit is what it is, right? It's just It just eats up more time, which is um, not what we're talking about when it comes to um, either of these concepts, all right? So um, the quote from uh, Mimun of Sashi in, uh, from his Book of Five Rings is, if you understand the way broadly, you will see it in all things, right? If you understand the way broadly, you will see it in all things, right? Um, I've thought about this for a long, long, long time. And of course, you know, teachers kind of point in certain directions or whatever. Luckily, I've had uh, a lot of teachers that um, don't just give the answers, right? They don't teach in the Western style, like, here's the answer, like you only need the answers because they're going to be on the test, right? 
which is not really learning at all. I mean, it's not that it's not learning, right? But it's not teaching you to use your critical thinking skills, right? If you're only memorizing things to regurgitate on a test, you're not learning an important skill, which is going to be immensely important in a self-defense situation, right? But it's one of the key, uh, the key uh, tools for life, right? And success, which is critical thinking, right? Um, it's, it's fashionable for people to just kind of toss things around, right? But very rarely do you get someone who stops and goes, wait, wait, that, that doesn't jive with this thing over here, right? I mean, how does that, how does that even line up, right? Um, because everybody's too busy trying to be, trying to sound intelligent or trying to be a member of the Mutual Admiration Society, okay? So, um, which is the worst place to be, right? Um, you know, I mean, if you think about this, and I, I mentioned this in the past, Any group that you're in, right? If you're if you're if you're engaged the same way everyone else is, right? Um, then you're average, right? For that group, you're average. It's just the way it is, okay? Um, and we run that risk if we're not aiming for something higher. Like if we're not in a group where we feel out of our element, if we feel out or off kilter, or we feel mm, shit, like, mm, I don't really belong here. These people are speaking above me. They're, they're talking about topics I don't know anything about, uh, whatever, right? Well, duh, right? If you're growing and you're trying to get better, you should be in a group where the majority of the people are producing results or thinking about things very, very differently than you are, right? Because if you want to gain greater results, you can't hang out with people who are thinking and doing things just like you and producing the same results, right? It just, it doesn't work that way, right? As much as ego wants it to work that way, because we're comfortable, right? Nobody will tell us that we're wrong. Nobody will tell, and everybody has the same excuses, right? Everybody has the same bullshit story, okay? All right, there's corruption, the man's out to get you and hold you down and all that kind of stuff. Meanwhile, there are people just like you or worse off that are producing the results that you want to get or better, right? So uh, I have a hard, fast rule when it comes to groups. One, um, unless I'm actually the leader of the group, like the dojo, right? Or this thing, right? Um, I never want to be the smartest guy in the room. Okay, because I'm the smartest guy in the room. I'm not learning. I'm not growing. Not going anywhere. Okay. Now the cool thing about this little this format and being a teacher in the dojo and all that, um, at least the way I I uh, approach it, is that there's a feedback loop going on. Okay. So the questions that my students pose help with my growth. Okay. Now. In the context of class, which is all about the student, I give them an answer, right? Even if the answer today is, I don't know, but I'll find out, right? Because I, I have teachers as well, right? Or based on what I know, here's how I would approach this, or here's how I've been taught to approach it, or whatever, right? But that doesn't make the question go away from me, okay? Because as a student, Right. I know it's hard for a lot of people to get their head wrapped around. Right. This guy's a Daishihan. He's a Soke. He's a whatever. Right. Then see, that's where the that's, there's that there's that bottleneck. There's that ceiling again. Right. That we run into because the way we define these people. Right. They're the they're the epitome. That's that's the final goal where I want to get to or whatever. Right. Um, but we never stop to consider that these people are still growing. Right. Because. This is life, right? We we grow and we hone and we get better at things because life continues to throw more challenges at us, right? Anyway, so uh, there should be a constant growing kind of thing, right? So anyway, um, I, I had a couple of questions that came in about more mindset kind of things, more things that uh, was more about the psychology of handling, 
right? Self-defense situation, right? Uh, those kind of advances and, and whatnot, right? So now I, I do have programs that are available and some of you guys are already going through these things, right? Like Ninja Mind, uh, First Seven Steps on the Path of a Buddha. Uh, there's some Mikyo stuff out there. Uh, there's uh, uh, yeah, an ebook and a, a meditation course called uh, something about the diamond mind. Uh, mind, not mine, right? I'm not selling you a diamond mine. Uh, if I had access to one, uh, I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't be trying to put a, a house back together the way I am uh, after a fire. So anyway, right? So I want you to think about um, these things and their application. But again, during this episode, we're going to be taking a look at, um, at uh, again, self-defense applications, typically the way Japanese martial arts, uh, like the Zen-based martial arts, right, um, approach it. And then we'll take a look at, at the, so that's the Omote, right? We'll take a look at the Uda, the hidden side of things, right? Because this is Ninjutsu and that's what we do, right? And then uh, we'll take a look at um, some Mikyo, the, the Mikyo symbology that, that matches up, right? Um, and, and it's not very different at all. I mean, the, the, the essence is the same, right? But the, the iconography and the descriptions and whatnot um, are a little bit different, right? All right. So um, moon in the mind or mind like moon, right? What the hell does that mean, right? Okay, so in this description, what we're talking about is a full moon, okay, a full moon, right? So when we think about a full moon, right, we think about this light in the sky, right? And uh, now here's where a Mikio connection comes in, right? The moon is actually doing what? It's actually reflecting the sun's light, but the sun is in a different position, right, relative to the earth, and it's a reflection thing, right? But we're looking at moon, okay? So it's a softer light, less intense, more, uh, uh, more not filtered, but kind of like that, right? It's less harsh, right? But the the central crux of the whole lesson, right, at the at the, at the onset, is that the moon's light shines indiscriminately on all things. Okay, shines indiscriminately on all things. Okay, so it doesn't pick and choose. There's no judgment, right? It's not like, well, I'm going to give light to those guys over there because uh, they're good guys, or they they uh, speak my listen, or you know, they're part of my mutual admiration society group, or whatever, right? So it's this idea of of an all encompassing light or uh, consciousness okay Cons consciousness right uh part of the noble eightfold path right consciousness right or uh there's right awareness okay what are we paying attention to okay so let's start there um and and then we'll, we'll uh, like i said we'll branch out okay so from the perspective oh let me jump on a couple of guys or not jump on but you know what i'm saying right so people are checking in and then we'll move over there so Oh my goodness, Miss Appenzeller, I have not uh, seen you or uh, connected with you in quite a while. I hope you're doing well. And Lee Davis says, Jonin kind of things. Well, of course, they're all Jonin kind of things because the Jonin is a warrior philosopher, okay? Um, understanding uh, the nature of things and what's necessary, right? So, um, you know what? I'm going to have to write this one down or try to remember this later. I've been uh, trying to plan ahead with the Kuden episodes uh, more than I have been uh, up to this point. And so I think I'm, I've got like 12 episodes mapped out into the future. Um, but it, because Lee just brought that one up, I just I just thought um, I did it. I did a commentary once and I'll have to dig this thing out. And hopefully I can find everything. Um for those of you familiar with uh, Sun Tzu's Art of War, right? Uh, there are thirteen chapters, and uh, one of the one of the. I'm sorry for the side sidebar, but we'll we'll come back, right? Um, one of the uh, misunderstandings by from by most, including Nietzsche practitioners, right, 
is that only chapter 13, right, uh, roughly titled The Use of Spies, uh, is believed to be um, about ninjutsu or about ninja. Um, but the reality is, one, right, that whole information gather or spying kind of thing, right, um, has a very limited application during wartime or, you know, here's just a, a job kind of thing, right? Here's here's one aspect, right? Uh, my, my premise was that the whole thing, right, is applicable to us. And anybody that's done any amount of training with Hatsumi Sensei and actually paid attention will start to recognize the lessons from the very first paragraph in chapter one, okay? Um, but my commentary was centered around the idea uh, now, the art of war is uh, Sun Tzu teaching from the perspective of an enlightened general, okay? And he is teaching the principles by which leaders lead massive armies, right? Everything from discipline to uh, to strategy to whatever, right? So... Um, what I did with my my commentary was I and I did it across a, a I think a thirteen or fourteen uh, part series in an old newsletter that I had done called Hanya. Hanya is the Japanese uh, word for prajna, which is the Sanskrit for uh, insight that leads to enlightenment. Right? Often people just say insight, but it's insight that leads to enlightenment. Right? Sometimes translated as wisdom, but that's that's not exactly right either. Right? English is a bad language to translate a lot of the stuff into. But anyway, um, so what what I did was I each each week, you know, folks got one of the chapters from uh, the Art of War, and then there was a write up retranslating that chapter. From the perspective, so the the omote, right? The the main part was a general governing an army. Okay, the uda. My premise was, for those of you watching video, you'll see this. Everybody else, I'm pointing to my head. A general commanding an army. So your mind is the general, right? in whatever condition it is and in whatever level of understanding it is, and then your body and the parts that you're using to carry out tasks for uh, conquering problems, for overcoming challenges, for producing success, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, that's the army, okay? So there was this, there was this kind of a switch, right? So uh, again, watching or looking at Lee's thing here, um, you could do that yourself. And I, I may slide it in as an episode anyway, just to make sure that the folks are clear on things up to this point, we've been, we've been defining three different types of ninja within a ninja family. Okay. The Jonin, a high man, uh, the person, one of them, right. That's overseeing everything. They're the connection between, excuse me, the, the everyday social construct, right. And how the, ninja organization is going to uh, operate, function, align, you know, who they're going to align with, all that kind of stuff. Tune in more like the managers. Uh, they get the orders and the, the direction, and then they formulate the, the strategic uh, mission, so to speak, right? And then choose, the, choose from the assets, right? These different people with different skills. And then the gaining, right? The low man, right? And again, these are not meant to be derogatory terms, right? It's just where you are in the totem pole, so to speak. Although that's a whole different story, right? Because the lower you are in the totem pole, the actually the more important you are. Um, anyway, so um, you could do the same thing, right? So think about which aspects of yourself, right? When you need to be the gaining, when you need to be the tuning, when you need to be the jonin, that kind of thing, right? So anyway, um, so let's get back to this, right? So um, where was I before I jumped ship? <laughs> okay, so this, this idea of clarity, right? So in very, very general terms, from a base level, 
um, moon like mind or a moon like mind or a mind like the moon, right? Has to do with having an expanded uh, perception, an expanded awareness or consciousness where you're taking in as much as possible. Okay? In Buddhism, there's a saying, uh, nothing doesn't matter, right? But it's actually a play on words because you split nothing between the O and the T. Okay. So nothing doesn't matter. No thing doesn't matter. Okay. We explore all things to understand as much as possible. Right. So what we're really looking at here, right. Again, this is just the start, right. Um, we're paying attention to as much of the attacker as possible. Okay. So, uh, you know, how they're holding their fist, their stance, um, those kind of things, right? Are they one of these guys that kind of bounce around, right? Or are they taking up a very low uh, stance with very little um, movement and, and that kind of stuff, right? They're in a waiting posture kind of thing, right? Um, are they still in intimidation mode, right? Uh, or are they talking smack, you know, whatever, right? Okay. So generally speaking, what's going on, okay? Um, now there's some hidden stuff, right? And we'll get to these things that, that most people miss, right? So I, I may have to jump around here a little bit. Um, so as a, as a precursor, as I just kind of a way to start it, one of the things that people miss is how do you identify style or what somebody's, uh, most likely to do, right? If you're not actually researching, right. And studying. Right. When I say study, I don't mean I have to jump into other people's martial arts schools or their styles or whatever. Right. Um, I mean, in today's world, people have YouTube. Right. So this would be a simple switch from surfing YouTube and Facebook videos and Vimeo and whatever else. Right. Um, being entertained by or thinking that we're training because we're, you know, we're watching all these cool moves and, oh, I'll have to remember that next time, uh, you know, whatever, right? It's just, uh, it's we're, we're not investing time, we're wasting time, right? But we have some kind of a justification for that, right? Um, but what we could be doing is bringing up, you know, th either thinking about a certain type of an attack or attacker first and then doing a search on, let's say, you know, we're looking at the good old boy right cross or whatever, right? So then we do a, a Google search. We have to start somewhere, but we do a Google search on um, what martial arts have a right cross or which martial arts use an uppercut or whatever, right? And then that'll allow us to branch out, right? Obviously, we start with the guys who are doing the haymakers and the bar fights and stuff like that and then move out, right? Because what we want to do is we want to see as many different forms of this so-called hook punch or right cross or whatever as possible. We could do the same thing with back fist and whatever, right? But right, once we get to know the, the punch, then we explore different styles, right? It's because how are those people launching that kind of a punch, right? What are their stances like? What other things are their go-to, right? That they that that that's just their preference, right? Um, I mean, for goodness sake, sports teams, football teams, basketball teams, whatever, right? Watch video of opposing teams that they're going to be playing in a week or a month or whatever and develop strategies based on those things. And their lives aren't on the line. Why would we not, right? So again, we want to know as much about that as possible, right? So that we can pay attention to a person's stance more than just Oh, that's a cool stance. Or, you know, we just recognize that he's in a fight stance. Okay. Uh, those kind of things. We're paying attention to those things, but not just when the punches are flying, not just when he's in a stance, right? The more we can broaden this out, then we start to recognize that it's possible to study physical body cues and or facial micro expressions, right? to recognize impending physical uh, action, right? Impen an impending attack, right? And it's something that I do 
when I go into corporations, right, or I teach groups, whether it's a, I don't know, uh, was one of the last ones I did, uh, an office um, of uh, counselors and psychologists and whatnot, right, um, to help make sure that they're safe because sometimes, uh, well, more than sometimes, right, um, verbal aggression and discomfort and all that kind of stuff can turn into uh, can turn into a different problem. Um, so anyway, um, so uh, what do those things look like, right? What are some of the cues and clues that a human being gives or gives off when they're about to go physical or when they're contemplating going physical, right? And so how do I tell the difference between someone who's enraged but leans toward passive aggressiveness or who is enraged, but they they talk a good show, okay? Because they're hoping that the threats and the the mean words and all that make the other person fold or go away. And how is that different from the guy who maybe doesn't say very much, but is about to punch you in the throat, okay? Um, you know, what body language cues point to the fact that the person is carrying or potentially carrying a weapon, okay? And where, okay? Um, what kind of research have we done to know the two most likely places that a thug carries uh, a handgun, okay? And then, see, now we don't have to watch for anything or everything. We have very specific things to go to, right? Because Mind Like Moon isn't just about the awareness, it's about knowing where to look, okay? Uh, in my video, Danger Prevention Tactics, uh, Protecting Yourself Like a Pro, I think is what the end of it. It's, it's on Amazon. Anyway, um, there's some scenes that we shot, and all these things were shot live. They were either in a you know, parking lot of malls or on the street at ATMs or uh, inner city stuff, right? I mean, and at one point we almost got attacked um, because <laughs> we were, we were, you know, uh, we weren't doing anything that we weren't supposed to be doing. We were in a place around certain mentalities that, um, let's just say that they were predatory, okay? And since we gave off a couple of little cues that uh, they didn't like, it almost became a major problem. So anyway, um, uh, but in that one, right, uh, one, just one of the lessons, for an example, is uh, doing a five-point safety check uh, when you roll up on intersections. I don't care if it's a stop sign or a full-on red light or whatever, right? And it's just really, really simple, right? You look at the four street, the four corners at the intersection where you are, right? And you look in your rearview mirror. What am I looking for? I'm looking for anything that breaks from the baseline of what's normal for the activity in the area where you are, right? Who's looking in your direction? Um, you know, whatever, right? Okay. And the, the more you do this stuff, the more experienced you get. Um, I was just having a conversation with somebody today about how uh, and I talk about this regularly, right? Especially if you're if you have intentions for passing the fifth uh, fifth degree black belt test, and uh, recognizing that saki, the force of the killer, right? That in that intent that people give off overtly when they're right considering, right, on the verge of right um, doing damage, right? Uh, so there's another another thing to pick up, but it's that that one's not necessarily. Uh, physical. It's not, we're, we're not looking for a lot of these things with the left brain, with the intellect. Okay. That can cover a, a wide range of things, but there's also uh, the right brain, right? There's also the subconscious uh, faculty that the left brain doesn't speak to very well, doesn't communicate with very well. And so we normally call things that, that come from that direction, you know, like intuition and, and those kind of things, right? Gut feeling, whatever. Excuse me. So, um, but again, it's broadening out the awareness, okay? But it doesn't just stop 
at their stance or their style or, you know, how is their hand held for a fist or it, it doesn't, it doesn't stop there. Okay. We also want to take a look at, and again, if, if you've been one of my students for a long time, then uh, the beginning of mod two, you're introduced to, to a framework called the five D's, right? Um, where we're taking, we, we give you this framework for helping to make sense out of chaos, which is really what a fight or war or whatever is, right? You know what they say, everybody has a plan until the first shot is fired or the fist, the first punch is thrown, right? And then you've got to figure it out. So we try to give you a framework to help you make sense out of the chaos. But the trick is to use your training time in the dojo to do that so much that you don't have to think about doing it. You just, again, intuitively know where you are, right? Um, in a situation. It's like when you first learn to drive, you pay attention to everything, right? Pressure on the accelerator, brake pedal, where these things even were, where the signal thing is and how that's different from the, from the, uh, the headlight or wiper uh, connection or, you know, whatever, right? Um, uh, all these things. And then eventually it just, becomes assimilated and you don't give it much thought at all, right? Even when you have those moments where you need to think about it, like 98% of what you're doing is still subconscious, unconscious kind of thing, right? So again, this seems really, really simple, right? And I'm, I'm betting, if I were a betting man, I'm betting that a lot of people have already jumped off at this point because they already know that right? Which is probably the biggest killer to enlightenment, right? The, those words, I know, right? But we need to go beyond that, right? Because the first D is what? For those of you who train with me, what is the first D? Let's get interactive since I'm watching the screen tonight, not just James. Anybody? Going once, going twice, okay? It's discern, okay? We're paying attention, right? So the very first D of the 5D framework is directly connected to this ski no uh, kokoro, the mind like the moon, right? Awareness. So what are we paying attention to? Right? We already covered how he's standing. We already covered what he might be saying. We already covered... Uh, you know, what style he looks like or what type of fighter he looks like he might be, right? And that gives us a certain intuitive sense, right? Uh, you know, is this guy a kicker, puncher, grappler, just as a bit, just as a, a base kind of thing, right? So, um, but what's he wearing? Okay. How will what he's wearing help or hinder his attack? Okay. Are his shoes good for the the uh the surface that we're on okay i mean if i had my wherewithal i would get taekwondo practitioners who you know, and, and it's not the black belts i have to worry about it's the guy that signed up for a yellow belt or a green belt course right learned a couple of cool kicks and then you know went about his business okay and now he's out to hurt people with those cool things right um i get those guys with sneakers on a gymnasium floor because if you've ever um ever been on a gymnasium floor, if you can remember back to, you know, middle school or high school or whatever, right? Especially basketball sneakers, okay? Like uh, Converse All-Stars and those kind of things, right? Those things are designed to be like uh, like the suction cups on an octopus tentacles, okay? Um, they stick really well, which makes pivoting to do a lot of those kicks really, really, really tough. Not that they can't do them, but if that rubber to that surface catches just right, he will unwind his ankle for me, right? I don't have to do anything other than get him to do the kick he's really proud of and do it fast enough and hard enough, right, that he'll end up hurting himself in the process, okay? Same thing with somebody who's in flip-flops at the beach, right? If he doesn't kick him off, then he's going to have a problem with those things cutting into his toes and or twisting, you know, under his foot and causing a stability problem. Uh, people are wearing clogs or, uh, you know, shoes that they've broken down the back or they're, you know, 
slip on, whatever, right? Okay, so I can pay attention to those kind of things. Um, how we'll call them form fitting, right? How snug are the pants, right? Uh, what what do they got going on? Okay, have I explored those kind of things so that I know whether there's a um, clothing to environmental match or disconnect? Okay. Oh, let's not forget mind. Okay, based on what I'm wearing. Okay. See, everybody thought it was all about him, right? Based on what I'm wearing, right? What tactics would better fit the environment, the clothing I'm wearing, those kind of things. Okay. Um, and it just keeps going from there, right? I mean, we, we've explored, come on, how many different ways between Whiteboard Wednesday and Kudan Podcast, right? Come on, not just the posture idea, but what's going on on the inside, right? Remember that come on, are holistic, right? Come I, while they look like stances, stances are physical things that are taken up based on martial arts style and based on whether you're attacking or receiving or whatever, right? Come I, the physical form of a come I is an outward reflection of what's going on on the inside, right? Mentally and emotionally first, okay? So again, we go back to that translation of come I being aware of my condition, right? So if I'm already in a certain state, <coughs> recognizing that the emotions and the adrenal response causes certain muscles and certain muscle groups to fire, especially the ones connected to the spine, that's going to inhibit certain types of movement while allowing for other types of movement, right? So if I've done that study and I recognize what those things are, then I'm going to be acting closer to my natural state than I am some foreign style that I, I I mastered, right? But it the 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 emotional mode or the 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 tactics and strategies that uh, are at its crux, right, may not match up with the the emotional state that I'm in, which is why we walk everybody through those four foundational emotion emotional states, right? Um, and I don't mean like happy, sad and all that, right? I'm talking about um, aggression, defensiveness, uh, neutrality, or just kind of that in charge ground holding kind of thing. And that carefree, uh, you can't touch me on the gingerbread man kind of thing, right? Um, and then there's this whole uh, uh, thinking, communicating, right? De-escalation kind of things, right? Um, so we, we do that. And in all honesty, I don't care what feels natural to you because we're not really talking about natural when we, when we talk about most people. We're talking about habitual, right? This is what I do all the time, so I don't have to think about this. But this other thing, right, it, that, that's not natural for me. No, that's not habitual, right? The more you do it, the more you'll be able to switch in and out of these different things, either because you need them to handle the type of attacker that's coming at you or the challenge or the problem that you're dealing with, if, if it's a life mastery kind of thing, all right. or as your emotional state changes relative to this person or what's going on, right? You will just naturally adapt and flow into these things, just like you don't have to think about anger or how to act when you're angry. You don't have to think about how you act when you're sad. You don't have to think about... <laughs> I once had somebody... <laughs> tell me that um, since their their significant other um, needed affection, right, or needed connection more than they did, this person was really cold, right, more than they did, what they would do to help the person out was they would schedule twice a day, and literally on a day, day planner, they would schedule twice a day um, to give this person a hug and or a kiss, right? Like, you can schedule feelings. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> maybe it's possible, but I don't. I don't have that skill. So, uh, anyway, so again, the uh, the the number of things that can be we can be aware of, right, um, increases our ability to be successful to see things happening, right, that other people miss we can see things happening that the attacker doesn't even know they're doing, right? If you can exploit something or if you can handle something or um, 
base your planning and your operation on things that most people are unaware of or the person who's, you know, you're trying to quell this or you know, whatever, right? That they're not aware that they're doing, then you can apply influence in a way that to them doesn't feel like they're being manipulated or anything like that, right? They still think they have freedom of choice, right? And so you can navigate things with less resentment, with less backlash, those kind of things, right? Um, really good for like parents and, and uh, managers and leaders and things like that, right? So um, anyway, so again, the more these things we're going to be aware of, again, this comes directly from um, our, uh, our Mikyo training as well, okay? So in, in Buddhist in Buddhist training and Buddhist study, most people are aware of the word Dharma, okay? Dharma, D-H-A-R. R-M-A. The one I'm speaking of, when I write it out in English, it's always written with a capital letter D, okay? Big D Dharma, right? And you'll hear me say that, Big D Dharma, okay? In this case, we're talking about truth or what is, right? The, the what is of the cosmos kind of thing, the grand scheme of totality, right? And again, truth, whatever, right? Okay. And again, English is not the greatest language to translate a lot of these things into, right? Um, there is another dharma in Sanskrit, dhamma in Pali, D-H-A-M-M-A, -M -M -A, right? But dharma in Sanskrit. Um, there's another one. Now, if you looked at it written in Sanskrit, these two look completely different, right? But here we are, right? So if you're reading, just like in English, if you're reading something, right, you can see the difference between two T-O, two also T-O-O, -O, the number two and the syllable two from like cartoon or tuna or tune, a piano, that kind of thing. We know the difference, but to hear it spoken, right? A, a person foreign to the language has to, has to really figure that stuff out. I mean, so did we when we were children, but now we just take it for granted, right? But it's the same thing in it, in that context, right? So, uh, the little d dharma, right? And again, that's how you'll hear me say, because then I, I write it differently. Um, lowercase d, H-A-R-M-A, -A, right? So little d dharma, that word means thing. Right? It's a thing, okay? And the idea is that anything, bigger thing, human being, car, chair, uh, a dance move. And I don't mean like the whole dance. I mean, just a simple move, right? A step and movement of the body, whatever, right? Is made up of dozens, if not hundreds of little D Dharma. Okay? Any kata that you've, you've learned or you're working on any movement, right? Stepping from Shizen into Ichimons no Kamai and delivering a counter strike. Again, there are dozens, if not hundreds of little actions that are going on. The more of these that we can be aware of, the more control we will have. And I don't mean left brain intellectually, whatever, right? If we recognize something, we can work on that thing until it's just, now we've got a handle on, on how that works, right? It makes my punch that much uh, uh, more powerful or that much more uh, uh, quick, right? you know, or whatever, right? So, uh, anyway, again, so there's this broadening out of things, okay? But it doesn't stop there, okay? It doesn't stop there. So before we talk about the next part, right, um, I, I see people coming and going and whatnot. Uh, let me see if there's anybody else on. So uh, let's see. It's good to see you and hear you talk. Well, at the end of my days, I'm tired of hearing me talk, so then my wife doesn't feel the same as you do. She would, she's always trying to pull extra out of me. And I say, I teach for a living. I, I'm, I've hit a point in my day where I'm tired of hearing the sound of my own voice. So, <laughs> but uh, I appreciate it. So uh, Lee was right with discern. All right. So we'll just, we'll, we'll leave it open and see if anybody else is um, out there. Uh, looks like everybody that's interacting with me at the moment is on Facebook. I don't see anybody over on, well, no one's, uh, interacting or whatever through uh, YouTube. Let's see. Maybe I need to switch that. 
What happens if I do that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, we'll not mess around with things. <laughs> okay. So um, let's jump over and take a look at the Mikyo or the Vajrayana uh, take on this. Because remember, I said this mind like moon is, uh, is a Zen concept, right? Now, not that it doesn't, it doesn't fit all over the place. And uh, this is not the the forum or the, the place to, for me to be covering like the three different vehicles, um, that were created over time as Buddhism grew and developed and, and things like that. Right. Um, and, or connections with anything else, but, um, so we're, we're going to, we'll go back to the moonlight cause the moonlight doesn't change. Right. I mean, it doesn't that what we've talked about with the moon doesn't change, but I need to pull in something from Mikyo so we get a better understanding of this broadened awareness. Okay. Oh, Jimmy's on. Come on, sir. Okay, so, um, okay, so uh, in Mikyo, again, everything in Mikyo is symbolic of something bigger, right? And it, that it's encapsulated, right? Uh, one of the analogies uh, my, my Buddhist teacher used to always give when it came to, uh, you know, having this this bija, like a seed syllable or uh, a sadhana or a mantra or something like that, right? that was just this syllable or three or a short phrase or a phrase or three or whatever, right? As opposed to this whole sutra, right? This whole lesson was that um, if you've ever gone to a toy store um, or you did it when you were a kid or whatever, right? You can get these little things that are in like a gel capsule. Looks like a pill that somebody might take, right? You drop it in water and that gel capsule um, dissolves. And what happens, right? You get like a, a towel or you get one of these foam animals, right? It's just a cutout shape kind of thing, right? That grows out just dozens, if not hundreds of times bigger than the capsule it was in. And there's no way for you to get it back in to that, that shape anymore, right? It's just, it's magic, right? So, um, it's that idea, right? But you have to have you have to understand the full lesson for that syllable to mean anything. Otherwise, it's just it's just gibberish. And if you're producing any results, it's either luck or it's an ego projection, right? You you know, it's just another diluted day at the office. Anyway, so um, in Mikyo. Um, there's a differentiation between the sun in the sky and this character, Dainichi Nyorai, right? Dainichi means great sun, okay? Great light, right? It points to full and complete enlightenment, right? In, in uh, Mikyo, uh, Anotaro Samyak Sambodhi, right? Complete and, and total enlightenment, okay? But again, there's this connection, right? Between, and again, it's a metaphor, right? What's well, a metaphor, right? It's for whatever you want it to be. <laughs> anyway, so my attempt at humor at this time of night. Anyway, so um, uh, we understand the sun, right? And it's light, right? Danichi Nyorai is symbolic of the universe as enlightened, right? It's, it's enlightened in and of itself, okay? There's lots of references like this, okay? But enlightenment being a certain type of light, Okay, so there's one reference in the Dainichi Kyo, right? The the, uh, the Dainichi Sutra. Actually, it's the Mahavrocha Mahavrochana Sutra, right? So in Sanskrit, Dainichi Nyorai, that's Japanese, is um, Mahavrochana, right? So again, great light, uh, whatever, right? So anyway. Um, so the, the, the writing, paraphrased, is though the sun shines on everything, right, because of the placement of things, right, there are some places that the light can't shine, right? It's, you know, where if I'm in my house 
and I've got curtains all over the windows and they're very, very bright, you know, they're very thick and, and whatnot, right? It can be broad daylight and I can turn off all the lights in my house and make it dark, okay? The, the sun's not getting in. Now we could argue about, you know, radiation and ultraviolet and infrared and whatever, but we're talking about light, right? That we can see, right? It's, it's an analogy, okay? So the reality is that based on structure or based on circumstances or whatever, there's some places that that light cannot illuminate. Okay. The same could be said about the moon because the moon is only reflecting the sun's light, but it's that it's a light source. Okay. So the, the outward lesson is just in, you know, lighting up the space so that you can see as much as possible. Therein lies the crux as much as possible. Right. So let's go back to the, the Mahavarochana Sutra. Though the sun's light shines on everything equally, there are many places that it can't go. But the light of Mahavrochana, of Dainichi Nyorai, shines on everything. Right? Nothing can be hidden from it. Okay? So what we're looking at is going past the idea of only being, only being able to see what's in your field of vision what can be seen by the human eye, what needs to be illuminated artificially so that your eyeball works, right? And, and takes in things, right? So now we're pointing to insight. Now we're pointing to other things, okay? So we can take the moon-like water, or I'm sorry, the moon-like mind, right? The mind-like moon and go beyond just what we can see, just what we're aware of in the moment, okay? What experiences, what does, what does experience tell me about how to solve this kind of situation, right? Do I have any, right? Or am I going to have to take other things and use my conceptualization faculties, right, and create a solution in the moment based on what I think I know about it, based on whatever, okay? Am I going to have to make it up on the fly? Um, what do I know about conflict? Okay. What do I know about the cause of conflict? Right. What causes people to lash out? Right. Again, most people jump on, well, they're angry about something or you did something to stand out or whatever. Okay. Let me tell you about a, tell you a quick story about standing out. Okay. Um, I was almost in a physical altercation once, right? I was almost attacked by somebody for the way I walk, okay? Simply, what it really came down to was I was walking a certain way and they associated that with something that they not only disliked, detested, and, and their belief system uh, made it a requirement that they remove me from the world. Okay. It was the way I walk. And luckily the person went verbal before he went physical and I was able to deescalate things. Okay. Because what he started with was calling me a baby killer. Okay. Now that was his analogy or that was his catchphrase for military people. Right. Because his his uh, politics, beliefs, whatever, anti-war slogans, whatever. OK. Um, wrapped all around that. OK. And you can find your own, you know, your own examples of this in today's world, regardless of whether people feel justified or not. It's the fact that they feel justified that you have to that you have to worry that that's what should give people concern. Okay. Well, you have to understand they were upset. I understand. I understand people being upset. I also understand that what came part and parcel with their acting out, uh, and I don't care what it was, burning police cars, blowing things up, marching on this or that or whatever, right? If violence ensued, part and parcel with them being upset was they felt that they were justified in acting out. No. What we train for is 
making sure that we can get ourselves and our family and anybody else under our, our protection out of an area like that because we might happen to be on vacation and in the wrong place at the right time. Right. And I'm not, it's not about a value judgment on people, right? Understanding what causes people to lash out. Okay. It's not always anger. Okay. This person, because I mean, the reality is I was military, but not at the time. This was five years after I left the military. Okay. Well, you must still have walked the same way. I didn't learn to walk the way I was walking in the military. The military's way of marching or walking accounts for the human being's way of normally doing it. And all they did was, was make it more structured. The arm swing and all that kind of stuff. Okay. The way I was walking at the time was all based on this martial art. And if you understand how that works and that your legs carry your torso and balance and all that kind of stuff, right? The better you get at it, the less your arms swing. But either way, that spoke to a part of his brain that said, structured, discipline, must equal military, must equal I must kill them. Okay? So not always anger. Okay? It can simply trigger other things. Okay? But what else could there be? Hurt. Right? There could be... Uh, undiagnosed psychosis. There could be an interaction from meds that uh, we didn't know about and the chemistry uh, fired a poop storm in the brain and whatever. Okay. Um, there's lots of things and, and studying that then can help with, with understanding, right? Uh, I have an episode coming up maybe next month, if that four or five weeks, something like that. Um, for dispelling anger. Now we're going to look at it from our side, right? Um, different ways to dispel anger based on uh, whether we do it with a primary focus on mind or how we can actually use our, our speech to affect the mind and the heart and make that change. Um, and also uh, a body language uh, or not a body language, a, a physiological thing, right? That you can do. There's a couple of series that you do um, that actually will sh make a shift in the mind and whatnot, right? But again, you, you want to have to, or you have to want to, right? Going through this, but not really wanting to, okay? Because if we understand uh, the, the new cellular science and all that, we understand that the more often we put ourselves into a certain state, the more our cells, when they subdivide and create sister cells, those sister cells have peptide docking ports on them more for the emotional state that we're in most often because we're very adaptive. So all the way down to a cellular level, I know I have weird hobbies, don't I? Anyway, um, we can get there faster, right? So somebody who just, you know, is addicted to being in states of anger and, and lashing out at people and whatnot, right? Um, it's going to take some time, right? Because we have to do things long enough so that the way the body does things, right? We have to continually put ourselves into the right states so that the regeneration and the, the natural subdivision and sister cells and all that kind of stuff, right? Catches up. I mean, we really, I mean, Mikio points this stuff out and has for the last 1600 years um, that we really are, it's, it's a process of recreating ourselves. Anyway, so, but anyway, so, this, this idea, right, again, we can still use the idea of the moon as a metaphor, but, you know, in Mikyo, it's it's a different symbol. But what we're looking at is this prajna, right, this insight, okay? So um, if we're paying attention to things like that, right, then how do we remove ourselves from a situation or take action in the situation to preempt things to keep that person from getting to that next stage, those kind of things, right? Um, but again, the, the, I'm coming at this from a self-defense perspective, but this has plenty of life mastery, uh, you know, the, the life side of things, the everyday side of, of, of things, uh, 
you know, to be to be doing things for or to be doing things with, right? The what it really comes down to is the more we're aware of, and the more we understand, then are the greater chances of success. Okay. Uh, I once uh, I saw this thing and it actually came out of it, it was out it was again I have weird hobbies it came out of a science journal and I can't remember the topic that I was reading on at the moment I just remember how it just like popped out because it it I was reading it at the same time I was going through some philosophical lessons and stuff from one of my teachers and it was popping up uh, on the Marshall side as well because of you know this one technique. Uh, I was working on and the feeling in that and the strategy and whatever. It just kind of popped up, right? And so, but what it really had to do was uh, with options, okay? Because people will people will end up in a situation and they'll say, I didn't have a choice, right? I had zero choices, okay? Well, to have zero choices, only you must be dead, right? Because everyone has a choice. Okay. You can choose to not choose, which is in and of itself a choice, right? But if I only have, let's just do the numbers, right? If I only have one choice, then I'm a slave, right? If I have two choices, I have a dilemma, okay? Because if both choices are equal and I know or don't know equally about these things and which one to choose, <coughs> my rule of thumb is I just pick one. Because as soon as I choose it, right, within seconds or minutes, I will know whether or not that was the right one because I can always switch gear, right? You know, while you can't go back, you can still make another decision. Anyway, so if you have two, you have a dilemma. It's not until you have three or more choices in any given situation where you start to approach the concept of freedom, okay? Three or more. Again, for those of you who've been around in the in the uh, Bujinkan or the ninjas, uh, the ninjas arts and whatnot, and remember lessons from the Gyoko school or the Togakure school or whatever, right? Um, there's that idea of three and one, one and three, right? Um, uh, in uh, Tagagi Yoshi view with balance breaking, right? Uh, breaking three lines of balance uh, at the same time, three or more lines of balance, but minimum three should be the uh, or minimum three. Three should be the minimum. Um, that, that you're going for, right? Um, anyway, so again, with this with this idea of of the insight, and nothing is not illuminated, right? So again, no thing doesn't matter, okay? Um, so then, a level of training can be to study what causes conflict, okay? What's what causes conflict, and that's what I teach people. Okay. On one side, I teach people about conflict, internal and external, right? Because if we can handle that and navigate it, right? Mitigate it, right? I don't know that I ever wanted to eliminate it because we forge ourselves through the challenges we go through, right? And we remember our achievements over hardship more than we remember the cakewalks. Okay. Right. So anyway, um, so I teach people how to handle that, but I, I sum it up and it, th this sounds more abrasive. So if you're definitely way over on the philosophical side, it's going to sound abrasive. Okay. Um, but I teach people how to not die in the face of mental, physical, or emotional threats. Okay. And that could be from life. It could be from heartache. It could be from a knife coming at you. It could be, of course, the knife is hopefully it's not floating in space, in which case um, that'd be really cool. And I'd like to see video. Uh, but, but anyway, you get the idea, right? So um, I, I teach people, you know, how to use these ancient proven time tested lessons to create the life that they really want to be living and how to handle the threats or dangers that might destroy that life or that might threaten that life. Right? Um, and it sounds a little bit woo woo maybe, but um, it sounds better than I teach karate. Right? 
Um, and for those of you in ninjutsu, they just got offended because, like, you don't teach karate, you teach ninjutsu. Um, at certain points in history, this was called karate. At certain points in history, it was called jujitsu or jutaijutsu. Okay. And not just as a way to mask things. Historically, it was done because that was the fashionable word of the time. Okay. So one less thing to cause anger in me because I didn't know or didn't understand this little historical tidbit. Because there was a time when, you know, I was pretty friggin' adamant about this is not that, this is this. And, and, and just one more, you know. And then once I learned a little bit more about history and reality, um, then ego didn't have as much to, to cling to, right? So anyway, um, so again, mind like moon, right, um, is, is about awareness. It's about clarity. It's about uh, having as much information as possible so that you had a greater chance of, of uh, being successful, right? This goes back to why we teach the different modes, right? This goes back to that three, you know, if I have three or more choices or options or whatever, right? Uh, and again, I've told people in the past that uh, while, yes, I absolutely believe that, that this martial art works and, and what I do is effective, not just because of belief, but because I've used it, um, I would never, I would still never say that this is any better than any other martial system or self-defense system or whatever, because ultimately whatever works for you works for you. Okay. If it, if it keeps you alive and uh, provides for happiness and, and satisfaction and things like that, then it can't be faulted. What I would say, however, is that this system gives a student more options because it's not style based. Uh, anybody that thinks needs to is style based needs more study time, nor research time, right? And not just skimming headlines or parroting back things that people on YouTube say. Uh, I think that's probably why I have less people listening to my stuff because I'm not telling people what they want to hear. Okay? That's not my job. Okay? You got plenty of people in your life telling you what you want to hear. Okay? So um, let's do this. We'll open it up to questions. Okay. Now, again, next episode, we'll, we'll do the mind like water because these two things go together, right? And there's actually a connecting point, right? Um, that's actually symbolized by um, the moon reflected on water under the right conditions, okay? The cool thing about that, right? Um, and I hope I remember this for next week's <laughs> episode, right? Is if you put a hundred bowls of water right? In a field or in front of your house or whatever, right? And the moon was shining above, the moon would shine equally in every bowl. Doesn't pick, it doesn't have favorites. Okay. There's also something that the water in the bowl is contributing to that connection as well. We'll do that next time. But anyway, questions or comments or anything about what, uh, or anything that I covered during this one, um, Anything we want to open up to, uh, to um, I don't know, adding to the value of, of the, um, the lesson, so to speak. Lee, I know you got something. I know you're not doing what you did the other night and just put your hands on the side of your head trying to hold everything together. No questions so far. Wow. I, 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 I am either that clear or it's going to take a whole bunch of extra time to sort out the gibberish I just threw at you. Hopefully it wasn't gibberish, but um, <laughs> is what it is, right? All right. Anyone? Anyone else? All right. Uh, I have another question, okay? And then I have an admin announcement I have to make, but... Um, what kind of value are you getting from this? Not just this episode, right? Um, why do you keep showing up? Other than, I don't, it, hopefully it's not because you don't have anything else to do on a, uh, on a, on a Monday evening or whatever time it might be, wherever you happen to be in the world. Okay? What value are you getting? 
one says very insightful. All right. Anybody? I know you're feverishly typing because that's what we gave you, right? On the comment side. Again, I'm, I'm only seeing quote or, uh, things coming in from Facebook. I don't know how to, well, maybe just everybody that's actively watching at the moment is on Facebook. Let's see if I can switch that to, hmm. What does that do? Nope. Don't want to block anybody. We'll leave that alone. Let's see. Uh, Kuden Shinden Taiden. My question to fill in the gaps of my training. Kuden Shinden Taiden. Um, I did. I did it. I think I did an episode. Um, or I did a lesson on that. If you go to the uh, YouTube uh, channel <clears throat> and type in, uh, I think it's in the order it, uh, that the title goes is Taiden Kuden Shinden. Okay, so um, so I a question to fill in the gaps of my training. Uh, I'm I'm not understanding if this is a statement or a question. You're a teacher. Well, you're either a teacher or you're a retired teacher. With I would assume that uh, grammar and punctuation would be there, but I stopped assuming a long time ago. Sorry, I get that it's jumbled. Yes, the order is. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So, uh, was that a question, or was that just the value that you're getting, or? Ellipsis, dot, 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 <laughs> question mark, question mark. Uh, let's see. <laughs> I just had a thought. This would be funny. Um, <laughs> if I put you to sleep, speak up. <laughs> Which would be really, really funny if somebody answered because they just woke up and that's what they heard. <clears throat> but then I find some things really funny. Anyway, all right, so while I'm, uh, let's see, the value I get is that you help fill in your chart. Okay, uh, all right, so um, I, I have an unfortunate announcement to make, and uh, it's not unfortunate like it's life-threatening or anything like that. Um, oh, somebody from, from the YouTube side. I listen for the little things, insights. Okay, awesome. All right, so... Um, I've been announcing for weeks, right, that our spring ninja camp will be May 5th, 6th, and 7th. I just found out last week that uh, my daughter's uh, college graduation date was moved right in the middle of what I was doing as spring camp. I can't not be there for her. Well, I mean, I can ultimately in the scheme of things, but I will not not be there, right? for a graduation. So <clears throat> I need to find other dates. And at the moment, it's not as easy as just bumping it a weekend because the weekend after is Mother's Day. And I'm pretty sure that guys that decided to come in for camp would either only be here for Friday evening and Saturday, and then Sunday would be a waste, or they would get killed if they went to a seminar on Mother's Day weekend by either their own mother or their wife or whatever, right? So um, can't do it then. So I need to look back one or two or forward one or two. Um, and there's already a couple of folks that are, uh, registered. So I need to check with them, um, uh, to make sure that well, either I don't have to do a refund or, um, or, uh, that something's going to work for them. Cause I don't, I mean, the couple of people that are signed up have really been looking forward to this. So I want to make sure that I don't, do them any injustice. So anyway, that's, th that's what I needed to put out. Um, also, if you missed it, um, uh, dates are, are up for fall camp. That's the end of September, beginning of October, um, uh, bridge weekend. So it's the 29th and 30th of September and the 1st of October. Right. Uh, and then we are going to Japan this fall. So, um, if you are interested 
please make sure that you uh, contact us via email at uh, either warrior C, W-A-R-R-I-O-R, the letter C, or just the word support at warrior-concepts-online.com. Um, uh, it is a slated to be a two-week trip. We're leaving uh, on or about, right? And when I say that, it's going to depend on uh, how I can negotiate uh, discounts on airfare and stuff like that. It's one of the biggest benefits of everybody going as a group with me leading. I've been there many, many times, and I try to free up as much of your money as possible for food and souvenirs or training or whatever, as opposed to uh, the necessities like airfare and hotel and whatnot. I mean, you know, I'm not going to put you on a paper airplane or whatever, but um, anyway, so we're scheduled for September 4th to September 18th, which is a Monday to a Monday. Um <clears throat> but we might end up leaving on a Sunday, coming back on a Monday, whatever, right? Um, so uh, it is a two week trip, full trip for people that wanna do the full trip, um, or you can do one or the other full week, right? I will not be running back and forth to the airport because people decide they're gonna do uh, the 9th to the 17th or something like that, right? Um, there will be a given, point, right, where I can work it into the schedule and we're not disrupting um, the itinerary or the agenda, right? But anyway, um, it, for those of you who are interested or might be interested, it is a full training trip. And when I say that, I don't mean the same thing that everybody else does. I never mean the same thing everybody else does, right? I don't mean that we're going to post up in Notice and only go to training at Hombu Dojo or the other Sensei's Dojos or whatever. We'll be doing plenty of that. But we will also be going to places like Nagano, Kyoto, places just places that are historically significant to the lineages and what we are studying. So we are going to temples that are um, specific to this. We will be going to Shingon, uh, Shingon Mikyo Temple, uh, it was the first one founded in Japan by Kukai, the uh, founder of the Shingon uh, school. And we will be going to uh, Hiezan to the Tendai uh, headquarters, which is the school that uh, I received uh, my, whatever you want to call it, right? I'm a uh, initiated lay teacher. Uh, I don't like the term priest and all that. I didn't go through ordination. Uh, if you need that kind of thing, then that's on you, not on me. Um, but we're going to go there. Uh, there's a castle in Kyoto that has a nightingale floor that was uh, invented, created by a significant figure in our history, all that kind of stuff. So you get a chance to walk on one of these floors that were designed to catch ninja. And it was designed by a ninja, right? Um, cool stuff, right? So uh, if you're interested, stay tuned, but get names in. There is a hard limit of eight people for this trip. That's it, right? Um, so uh, once we have some names in, you'll be on the early notification list. Then I will be scheduling uh, a, a meeting class, whatever. It'll be there'll be a live version at the at the academy, but there'll also be a virtual version for those of you who are not local, right? Uh, and that one is to go into the trip much more deeply. Uh, by then, I will have an itinerary worked out, and I will have done my requisite research to make sure that I understand uh, where things are in Japan, pricing wise, and and you know exchange rate and stipulations and all those kind of things. And then, so what I'll do is I'll walk everybody through the trip, right? What we're doing, and and when, and why, and how, and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know then it'll be where the rubber meets the road, right? Uh, minimum down payment and or payment in full so that when it's time for me to start uh, buying everybody's airfare and Japan rail passes and all that kind of stuff, right? Then it's there and you're locked in and it's all good to go, okay? So uh, that's that. So what else do we have? Anybody else post anything while I was just uh, throwing that stuff out? Don't think so. All right. So um, that's it. That's what I have for this one. Uh, anything else? Anybody have anything else that uh, any questions, comments, 
complaints, anything that you want to toss out there before we wrap this one up? I should probably not have closed the chat window if I were really interested in hearing what people had to say. Sorry about that. I'm just, I'm trying to do the job of two people here. So anyway, um, all right, I don't see anything. So you have the email address. If you have any questions or comments or topic requests or anything like that, right? Um, send it to Warrior C, Warrior and the letter C, W-A-R-R-I-O-R, the letter C at Warrior dash concepts with an S, warrior-concepts-online.com, all right? That's it. Uh, hopefully, I will see everyone again uh, next week. If not, you know, the recordings are always available. So that's it. That puts another one in the can. I will talk to everybody again next time on Kuden. Get more of Kuden Radio. Subscribe through your favorite podcasting site or join our clan of serious modern warriors at onlineninjaacademy.com.